This is the WGBH Forum Network. The Creative Method. The National Association of Educational Broadcasters presents Dory Sherry on production. Here first is Lyman Bryson. Making a motion picture is one of the most technically complicated of creative acts. Where does a motion picture producer begin? I asked this question of Mr. Dory Sherry. I suppose it would be proper to say that he starts with the will and the desire to make a film, since we are talking about films. Now he begins his search for material and finds it in a variety of places and a variety of ways. He's looking for an idea. He's looking for a motion picture. He may find it in a novel. He may find it in a play. He may find it in a television show. He may find it in a short story, in a magazine article. He may find it in, a, um, in an idea of his own that a certain kind of uh, background would make an interesting film. You're listening to Dory Sherry on production. The Creative Method. The producer as creator. One of ten conversations with creative Americans about the nature of their work. The Creative Method, prepared by WGBH-FM in Boston, under a grant from the National Educational Television and Radio Center. Now, Dory Sherry on production. And here is Lyman Bryson. Well, now you've got, uh, working for you up to this moment, Mr. Sherry, you've got uh, an idea in your own head. You're working for yourself. You've got a writer in whom you have confidence who is uh, trying to put this... When do you begin to uh, put, put this into shape? When do you begin to think about cast? Oh, you don't, begin about, uh, you don't begin thinking normally. You don't begin to think about cast until you have a motion picture script all finished. You have ideas as you work on it. The script, then, is the heart of it. The, the, script, script, is, uh, the, script, the script expresses is always the, idea. the heart of it. Well, now, you've got... Uh, you, you get your cast to suit the script after the script is something like satisfactory and your director uh, I suppose comes in at the same time as your cast comes in no normally the director comes in a little earlier than that does he help in the casting yes you cannot get a director uh, of any stature unless he is uh, very sharply concerned with the casting with the entire setting of the picture and with the script itself he will want to be heard on the script. He will have a point of view. He will uh, have many questions to ask. What is it you want to achieve? How shall he interpret the uh, picture? You see, one of the most fascinating things, and one of, of course, the most difficult thing in the making of a picture, is the establishment of a, um, a monitor image. If you watch uh, motion picture people who have been engaged in making films for a long time, you will see that they very often will use their hands uh, when they discuss, uh, it's a wonderful scene, they will say, it's a wonderful scene, or this can make a wonderful scene, and um, almost uh, as a reflex action, their hands will frame a picture. And they are searching for an image in their own minds. Now, the producer may have started with one image. He then has to translate that to the writer, or conversely, the writer, if he has come to the producer with a point of view, will have to translate that to the producer. And hopefully they will see eye to eye. Now the director comes in. And he too now has to discuss with the writer and the producer what they had in mind. And then he will make a contribution of his own. And hopefully everybody's image is the same. Now you go through the following steps. You go through the uh, uh, set designer, the wardrobe people, the prop uh, uh, men involved, the cast, the photographer, the uh, electricians, all those who are concerned with the lighting of it, and everybody hopes that they all see that same image. Now, it's a very difficult thing, perhaps, to understand, but they all are thinking of images as they talk and as they write. And those pictures that turn out best are those that when you go to see them, all finished, everybody looks at it and says, it's exactly what I had in mind. 
I suppose if you didn't have this capacity to see the idea in pictures, you wouldn't be working at this job anyhow, would you? Well, you you couldn't. This is the basic basic ability. You could. Basic talent. Well, now you've got you've got all your you've got all your people, Mr. Sherry. You've got all the elements, the physical and the personnel elements that go together, and you've got your script, and you are hopefully uh, sure that everybody has the same general idea of mm-hmm. what is to come in terms of something to look at. So, That's right. Something in terms moving of an image. on a screen, a moving image. Well, now, how do you go about uh, turning this idea? into uh, something that happens on a set mm-hmm. which can be photographed. How do you turn it into physical action? In the uh, case of the most recent picture I've been concerned with, which is Lonely Hearts, we started with a uh, book, a well-known book by Nathaniel West, which is rather esoteric, but as the years have gone by, the book has become much more... Uh, the book has become uh, better understood, perhaps, and accepted as a classic. Uh, last season, Howard Teichman dramatized it as a play. The play, unfortunately, was a failure. But there were elements in the play that were very attractive to me as a producer. And I felt, always felt that the book had something of great interest. I felt, however, that the book was essentially a literary conceit. And I did not think it was a dramatic story, even though the point of view or a point of view in the story always attracted me, which was the basic uh, conflict between good and evil, the basic uh, uh, conflict between cynicism and faith. The play, I felt, fell between two stools. It did neither the book, which I didn't think it could do, and it did not depart enough from the book to make a strong play. Though I was grateful to Teichman for having tried it, and I did buy the material. Then I began to refashion this in um, uh, what I thought I wanted to tell as a producer. The more I studied it, I felt that it was a mistake to cast the book or the picture in New York City. When you say you you, you refashioned it, now you're looking for that image. I'm looking for the image. You're not writing a script. No, I'm just looking for that image. looking for the image. And I felt that I would be better off, it would serve me better, if I took the uh, book and the play and put it in a Midwestern background. I then began to think in terms of um, the image of the newspaper itself, which is the background of the story. I felt again that the book would be better served by not making it a big, high-pressure urgent newspaper of the 20th century. So I thought instantly of the kind of a newspaper it would be, the actual um, uh, look of the city room and of the feature room, that it would be old and that there would be new devices that were kind of superimposed on this uh, uh, rather old patina. And um, this is what I began with as a producer and then uh, discuss this at great length with uh, the writer of the screenplay, which uh, happened to be myself, and we had some very big arguments about what we wanted to do. And uh, you don't have any rule about who overrules whom in a case like that. Uh, well, producer always has the last word. The producer has Even the last himself. word, but in this instance, I uh, decided that the writer was going to have the last word, so I just told the producer to uh, stay out of my affairs for the time being, <laughs> and uh, I went ahead and. Uh, wrote the screenplay, um, trying to catch this image that I started with. In the early uh, stages of it, I discussed it with Vincent Donahue, uh, who had directed uh, uh, my show Sunrise at Campobello. He had never done a film, and I had a feeling he might like this. He did. And uh, he then began to make uh, observations and uh, uh, criticisms and I thought they were very helpful indeed. And we all, we both had the all same image, us. all three of us, the, the, producer, the, t- the producer Sherry and the writer Dory and uh, Vincent Donahue, the director. And uh, before we were finished with the script, I felt that more and more as I was writing it, that the man I'd like to see play the uh, character of Lonely Hearts 
was Montgomery Clift. I had a feeling that everything about him was right for the part. So I called uh, Mr. Clift and uh, told him a little bit about it, and he said he'd be glad to read the first 40 or 50 pages, which is all I had. He read it and fortunately liked it very much and said he would play it. So we had our young man, and we both agreed on that, that is, Donahue and myself. You had four of your necessary elements. Now we had four. Next, we um, had the problem of getting the city editor, or rather the feature editor, William Shrike. And uh, we knew we needed somebody tough, hard, but not in the uh, conventional mold. We did not, the, the script was not written to accommodate for the cliche, hard-boiled editor. This was the front, the front page. No, no, he didn't talk out of the corner of his mouth. He was a highly articulate, uh, though bitter and cynical man. And the more we thought of it, uh, we felt that Robert Ryan would be able to play him to a fairly well. Again, fortunately, uh, Bob was visiting here in New York, and um, I asked him, I asked if I could see him. He came up. We talked a little bit about it. I read him a couple of the scenes, and he said, sounds fine with me. Let's go. So now we had our next. You're assembling these people in New York, not in Hollywood? No, I was. I assembled them all here in New York. And then uh, for uh, Robert Ryan's wife, the one I had always felt was right for it was Myrna Loy. And uh, she lives here most of the time. And I called her send her a copy of what we had, and she said she wanted to do it, and we had that. Vincent Donahue felt that <coughs> for one particular role in the film, um, it was the role of a, um, a housewife, a very fascinating and interesting part. She plays the role of a seductress. Um, we wanted to get Maureen Stapleton, who had never made a film, we met with her. She liked what we had done, and we signed her. So we it had. Sounds as uh, if producers never had any trouble getting what they wanted, Mr. Sherry. Well, uh, I'd like to make a point about that in a moment because you asked first how we put this image together, and then I'll tell you how uh, how lucky I think we were to have accomplished all this, and how tough it is uh, sometimes uh, uh, to get what you, what it is you want. We were lucky in this instance, and when we got back to the coast. We then began to uh, cast our other roles, part of the ingenue and our character parts and so on. And finally, we had exactly the people we wanted. We then went, we built the sets uh, at the Goldwyn studio, where we were to shoot the film, and we rehearsed our people, which was quite unusual too. Normally, you don't rehearse a film as you do a play. We rehearsed this, though, for two weeks. The whole thing? The entire thing. And everybody saw what everybody else was everybody doing? Everybody else was in on what everybody else was doing. Well, now, ordinarily, you do a play that way, but you do a film in bits, you, don't you? You, you do questions. a film in bits. You see, because you have to do that because most pictures, the average picture, concerns itself with much more outdoor material than we had. This picture, uh, Lonely Hearts, happens to be well-contained. It was designed to, uh, to be a different kind of a picture. And we were able then to rehearse and accomplish what we wanted. And then when we got to shooting it, and we shot it day by day, uh, we were able to know what we were going to get to a great degree because we had rehearsed, we had examined it through uh, camera finders, we knew the images we were searching for. And so when we began to shoot, uh, again, we were fortunate in that we didn't have too much trouble getting what it was we wanted because we had spent all this time designing it carefully, and we had none of the problems attendant on a picture, let's say, like um, the big country, which deals with tremendous scope, and you have to go out on locations thousands of miles away and wait perhaps for days until the sun or the uh, moon, if it's a night shot, is in the right place and the cloud formations are proper, and you have to wait for uh, action to take place at the right time involving many horses and movement of men or uh, wagons and if one little thing goes wrong you've got to do it all over again it might take you days to get uh, 40 seconds of film that looks perfect and looks as though it was done quite easily we didn't have those problems you could have done yours on a stage almost 
To a degree, yes. To well, a degree. And is this the real reason, Mr. Sherry, for the fact that um, in producing a film, uh, you have to do it in rushes, in bits, and then put them together. You don't even do them in the uh, consecutive motion of the drama itself. You do them whenever you can. Is it just this geographical condition that makes that? Uh, no, no. A large part of it is economic. You see, let, uh, let me give you an illustration. If you, let's say you have a uh, minor character who appears in the first scene of your, uh, in the first scene of your picture, and he might not reappear until the last scene of the picture in terms of the construction of the story. Now you, that actor's work might be two days' work if you consider his two scenes. If you start him on the first day of your picture, let's say he's an actor who gets a thousand dollars a week. If you start him on the first day of your picture, and if your picture should continue for, let's say, 12 weeks, and you don't use him until the last week, you would still have to pay him a thousand dollars a week for each one of those elapsed weeks because he has the term of employment. So what you do is you shoot the first scene, and then you shoot the second scene. You might do that all in the first week and finish up with the actor and not take on the uh, responsibility of paying him for all that time. And you can put him away on ice, so to speak, until you yes, need you to can fit put him that, into the story. Uh, scene away until you're uh, ready to put it into film, you know. I think most people, Mr. Sherry, are fascinated by the function in this process that you're describing so interestingly of the man who cuts the film. Now, we mm -hmm. all know that... Uh, uh, there's a face on the cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. that, was, mm -hmm. uh, that was the fellow that got left out. How much, uh, what's the relation between the producer and this uh, uh, small uh, god that sits with the cutting machine and cuts up the rushes? Well, what he, uh, his function is as far, he, he makes a real contribution because uh, very often he will help you in terms of the pace of the picture, his notions about how the film should be cut. He puts these pieces of film together. You view the dailies or the rushes as they come in every day uh, with the cutter, with the director, and you give him a general sense. The director usually says, this is what I had in mind. This is why I shot this particular angle. I had a feeling that the accent should be here, and the cutter will know what the director had in mind. He then assembles all that film into a sequence. You look at it and you say, I think it's good, or you say, no, I think there's something wrong here, and you will discuss it. And then All the, the material is still available. Oh, yes, it isn't thrown away. Yeah, that film isn't thrown away until your picture is in release. Then it's finally uh, dispensed with. But he does not make the final decision. The producer, uh, the way motion pictures are constructed today, uh, the producer is the final arbiter the final word. It looks as if the producer had to have about all the talents, Mr. Sherry, uh, and I suppose that's always true of somebody who occupies so central a place. Uh, what kind of talent uh, is most uh, in demand? Or, uh, I suppose this is not a question one ought to ask, but uh, is there ever enough talent in this sort of thing? I was just going to say that when you ask what kind of a talent is needed, good talent and there never is enough uh, good talent. There is always room for uh, someone of superior gifts. All kinds? All kinds. There are good writers needed, good directors, good producers, good cameramen, good everybody. And um, it requires, of course, uh, this indefinable something we call talent. The young I, person I, I has... I have no a... way of defining it. Well, I suppose you, you're a judge of it. You don't have to define it. The young people, person generally has a feeling, Mr. Sherry, that... The world of the motion picture is fascinating and full of dazzling rewards and things like that, but almost impenetrable, almost impossible to get into. The streets of Hollywood, of course, are notoriously uh, walked by millions of young yes, men and women probably. who have to go get jobs as shoe salesmen and waiters because they can't show their talents. Well, I have the uh, feeling that no rose is born to blush on scene. It takes time in some cases. It requires enormous patience, enormous uh, endurance. You have to have the ability to, um, to overcome heartbreak, disappointment, frustration. Uh, this is in addition to uh, what we were talking about before, which is talent. 
I think one of the most discouraging things about, um, quote, show business, unquote, is the fact that talent and character do not often go hand in hand. I have known some brilliantly talented people who I have absolutely no use for personally. I know some uh, wonderful people who unfortunately are not very talented. But I am convinced that if you have the ability to endure, and if you have your eye on a star, and you are willing to pursue it, and go through all the pain, and all the, uh, all the disappointments that you will face, that you will get a chance to show what you have to uh, offer. The star you have your eye on may turn out to be yourself. Well, uh, I really don't think so. From work that I've done in um, various fields of, uh, or I should say from work I've done in biography, I'm uh, pretty well convinced that um, people are very confused about themselves. Someone uh, once said that, they're, uh, that we all are three different kinds of man. Uh, what we think we are, what others believe we are, and what we really are. And um, I think most of us live in this kind of confusion. We're never really quite sure. It is someone else, in um, historical terms, who finally makes this identification and says this is what he appears to have been. And very often, even that uh, appraisal might be inaccurate because all of us are a a welter of uh, drives, uh, unspoken ambitions, fears, uh, courage, all the other things that go into making a human being. And many of these things, most of them, I'm convinced, are never fully articulated. We go, we shuffle off finally down this long corridor of time and nobody really ever knows exactly what we are. We can only guess. Um, so. Referring again to uh, keeping your eye on the star. That star that I talked about is perhaps an image of its own. It uh, may be in the image of power. It might be in the image of fame. It might be in the image of money. It might be in the image of um, uh, a very noble ambition, such as wanting to do something good for your fellow man. It might be related to, oh, 1520 or a hundred different kinds of drives that men have. But it has to be a fixed point, and you have to dream about that point and hope that you can reach it. Now, you may finally reach that star and find that it's not the one you want, or by the time you have found it, uh, you may have changed some of, its, uh, some of the points of the star. But you have to have that fixed point of view. It helps to get there. May I ask you one more question, Mr. Sherry? Do you see in, uh, in the present uh, situation of the motion picture industry a great artistic future? Are there other ways of translating ideas into communication, into drama and so on, crowding the film off the stage, so to speak? No, films will um, never be crowded off. The motion picture industry has gone through many radical changes in um, the last uh, 20 years. The elimination of um, certain secure economic uh, advantages like block booking, uh, production companies owning theaters, which ended with divorcement, the divorcement proceedings, the um, advent of television, the advent of um, other diversions, the fact that a man, our audience, has much more leisure time has also changed the concept of motion pictures. But man will never um, stop going to motion pictures because motion pictures uh, isn't just a passing thing. It is a uh, concept of entertainment. Uh, television, after all, it projects an image. It is a motion picture of its own. It's a much smaller motion picture. But it is a motion picture. And it is true that it takes a, an event that's going on at the moment and transports it to someone else, but does it in terms of a picture. So motion pictures will not uh, 
uh, die away. The number of motion picture houses will diminish. The number of films being made uh, are much less today than they were three years ago, two years ago, a year ago. And it is possible that a year from now, the number of pictures being made will be less than they are now. But there will always be theaters because people want to congregate, people want to look at a wonderful big image in, uh, in the theater. And the proof is that there have been more great successful pictures since television than there were in the years before television. The audiences have become much more discriminating, much tougher to deal with, but when you give them a picture that they like, more people will go to see it, more people will pay more money to see it than they ever did before. Dory Sherry on production. And here again is your host and commentator for The Creative Method, Lyman Bryson. Mr. Sherry concluded by expressing persuasively his optimism about the future of the motion picture. We will always want to see pictures on a screen, he said, and although theaters may be diminishing in number, uh, may not be so many pictures made, the great colossal pictures of the past may not be uh, so numerous in the future, still the essential artistic future uh, of the motion picture is assured because it is a valid art. And this optimism is partly explained by Mr. Sherry's answer to the first question which we put up. Where does one start? Where does a producer start in making a picture? Well, he starts anywhere. He starts with a script, uh, with an idea, uh, with a character, with a setting, uh, with a theme. And, of course, above all, he must have a theme. Mr. Sherry makes it quite clear that no picture can amount to anything unless it says something, something that comes sincerely uh, and uh, uh, eloquently uh, from the group that make the picture. This, again, is a collaborative art. And he says that the future of the motion picture is also assured by the fact that uh, there's no danger ever of having too much talent, and whatever talent we can produce uh, will find its place. He gives a warning, however, at that point, which might be of great interest to young people who are a little bit struck with the glamour of Hollywood. Talent, he says, without character, is not much good to the producer and not much assurance of a career. Unless you've got energy, uh, of course, unless you've got talent, of course, but unless also you can work together with those in this great collaboration toward the motion picture, unless you know how to follow instructions, unless you know how to fill your own place where you belong, then your talent really won't last very long and you're not much good to this producer who is the leader of a team in a collaboration to produce the work of art. Next week, we're going to turn to another of the very newest of the arts, jazz and popular music. We're going to talk those over with Mr. George Shearing. Thank you, Dr. Bryson. You've heard Dory Sherry, the producer as creator one of ten conversations furthering our understanding of creativeness in American arts and professions. The Creative Method is recorded by WGBH-FM in Boston under a grant from the National Educational Television and Radio Center. Producer Jack D. Summerfield with Lorland Thatcher and Bill Kavnis as production associates. This is the National Educational Radio Network.